Hello. We're talking today with Glenn Greenwald, who is an American lawyer originally uh, and uh, an author. He uh, writes for Salon.com, uh, very well known in the US and, in fact, around the world for his uh, commentary on issues dealing with human rights uh, and civil liberties. We're talking to him today in the context of uh, uh, the Canada-US uh, effort to jointly uh, secure a perimeter around uh, Canada, a security, and the U.S. a, a security perimeter. Uh, but I wanted to ask him first, he's the author of a book called With Liberty and Justice for Some. Uh, as I was going through the, the book, it seemed to be almost an unrelenting indictment of uh, successive U.S. governments uh, in terms of uh, what your title, in fact, uh, makes a mockery of, with liberty and justice for some, not for all. Uh, is it really as grim as that? I think so. I mean, the reason that I wrote the book is because I, I realized that the issues that I tend to write about on a daily basis in my column have this underlying theme that drives them, uh, which is that it isn't just that the law fails to be what it was intended to be, which is a tool to equalize the playing field, so that even if we're very unequal in a variety of realms financially in terms of our talent, our power, there would always be this one realm that made everything, including those other inequalities, fair, which was the law, that we were all equal before the law. It's not just that the law fails to serve that purpose. It's worse than that. It has become an instrument that bolsters inequality in every other realm so that those who are powerful or financially wealthy – um, are able to bolster and, and shield their prerogatives at the expense of everybody else. It's a complete reversal of what the law is intended to be, and it renders all those un other inequalities illegitimate and unjust. We all remember the many stories uh, growing up about how North America and, and the United States in particular was a land of opportunity, that uh, uh, you could get a fair shake there and remake yourself. Uh, but you're indicating that uh, something fundamental has really kind of changed uh, uh, in recent years. And uh, you make a point of uh, the, the Nixon pardon as being some kind of a pivot. Uh, explain that a bit. Well, it's always been true in American history that this ideal of equality before the law was violated in all kinds of often very radical and violent ways. I mean, the country was born of you know, fantastic inequality embedded in the law. Um, but even during those times when there was this radical inequality, the principle that inequality would not be permitted in this one realm of law was maintained and vigorously affirmed so that it became the guiding principle, the animating uh, template for how Americans understood progress and how they went about eradicating those injustices. So that in the past, it was always the case that these forms of inequality were considered departures from the principles that we embraced. And what happened with the Ford pardon of Nixon was Gerald Ford had to go on television and justify to a very angry nation why it was that the highest level and most powerful political figure in the country, who actually built his career on a very stern law and order platform, was going to be completely immunized, completely shielded when he got caught committing very serious crimes, whereas the rest of the country, ordinary Americans and, and the like, uh, were prosecuted quite harshly for far less severe crimes. And Ford went on television and he explicitly argued um, this series of arguments, this rationale about why it was that it's in all of our national interest to allow someone in his position, in Richard Nixon's position, to simply move beyond the question of criminal prosecution. The argument was made that he had suffered enough, that it was better for the country because of how disruptive it would be to hold him accountable. And what really that signified, what that, that, that triggered was this express rationale that we no longer are all equal before the law. It was for the first time a set of arguments were made that if somebody is sufficiently powerful, if their prosecution, if holding them accountable would be sufficiently disruptive, then it would be better for everyone uh, if we didn't treat them equally, if we simply let them go and, and, and sort of uh, be without any kind of punishment. And that became the template for how political and financial elites in the future justified their own immunity when they too got caught committing serious crimes. And, and so now it's very common, not just that we violate this principle, but to hear elites in the United States explicitly reject the principle that we're all equal before the law and argue instead that we have an interest in ensuring that people who are sufficiently important to the society aren't subjected to criminal proceedings. 
Let's flash forward a little bit to uh, where we are today, uh, post 9-11. We all uh, have heard the terrible stories of the kinds of abuses that took place in places like Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo. Uh, we all kind of felt that was part and parcel of the, uh, the Bush-Cheney uh, regime. Uh, and that things would be different with a, a new person in the White House, a new Justice Department in Washington, uh, yet uh, they don't seem to be. What, what happened there? Well, the very first thing that the Obama administration did in this regard was it essentially made clear that it did not want any criminal investigations, let alone prosecutions, for this series of egregious war crimes and other criminal acts that were committed by high-level officials under the Bush presidency. And what that signaled was that the promise that candidate Obama ran on, which was restoring the rule of law, was really just a myth. Um, because the minute you say that all of these most powerful officials should be given full-scale immunity, despite having gotten caught committing very serious crimes of torture, of rendition, um, of eavesdropping on Americans without the warrants required by law, of attacking Iraq aggressively based on false pretenses, you're essentially saying that which is the core Bush view, um, that the rule of law does not apply to power, powerful political officials in the national security context. And that was the principle that President Obama embraced almost immediately upon taking office after promising that he would be open to the idea of prosecution. And what that led to was this whole series of uh, embracing of some of the most controversial and radical Bush theories of executive power, and in many cases going beyond what George Bush ever claimed in terms of theories of executive authority, acting with total secrecy and without accountability, doing things like claiming the power to target American citizens for assassination in complete secrecy, no transparency, no due process, really creating this kind of omnipotent presidency um, that is no longer just a radical right-wing Republican controversial policy as it was under the Bush presidency, has really now become bipartisan consensus, normal orthodoxy in America's political class as a result of President Obama embracing virtually the entire agenda um, and in some cases even going beyond it. We in Canada, of course, are concerned because of our close proximity uh, to the United States. Uh, we are uh, neighbors and we are uh, friendly uh, neighbors and have been for generations. Uh, but every time the U.S. gets itself into one of these uh, strange situations where there seem to be excesses. Uh, I think a lot of Canadians hold back and say, you know, what are we, uh, what are we involved in here? But uh, we also hear our own politicians here in, in Canada to say that any attack on the United States is an attack on Canada. Is there any way, uh, really, that uh, someone in a Canadian position, the Canadian government, uh, or Mexico on the southern border can really extricate themselves from any of this? I think so. I mean, I think, you know, one of the problems has been that the allies of the United States really didn't act very much like allies um, or friends uh, when the United States was off committing these grave abuses and excesses. Um, a true friend tells you that you're doing wrong and that you're engaging in conduct that is counterproductive to your interests. Um, you did see some of that in the run-up to the Iraq War. Countries like France and Germany tried to tell the United States that it was committing a serious mistake in attacking Iraq, um, and it created a lot of hostility in the United States. Um, but there weren't very many other allies of the United States doing that. Countries like uh, Spain and Italy and Australia, and even to some extent Canada, um, you know, stood by the United States, not necessarily with Iraq, but certainly in Afghanistan and, and with other of these abuses. And, and you even seen when it involves Canadian citizens, um, such as Omar Qadar, the uh, sort of child soldier who has been in Guantanamo, um, Mara Arar, who was the Canadian uh, citizen who was rendered to Syria by the United States and has been shut down when trying to get um, justice in American courts by both the Bush and Obama administrations, arguing that he has no right to access courts. Even when it comes to Canadian citizens, you don't see the Canadian government standing up for its own citizens against the abuses of the United States. And I think it's up to Canadians and, and citizens of every country to demand that their government stand uh, opposed to the United States when the United States does the very things that we've always lectured to the world is, is the act of, of, of despots and tyrants. We've uh, been told that uh, because of our economic ties and that they are so close, that uh, one of the things that we fear most about another attack on uh, the United States might be that there would be an even greater tightening of the border. 
we have an awful lot of commerce going back uh, every day on a daily basis. And also, uh, people, airline passengers, people uh, traveling on ground and so forth. Uh, and the, uh, in, just in terms of, of that commerce, the air travel and so on, uh, we have had instances where people uh, flying from point A to point B in Canada that might traverse uh, a little bit of U.S. airspace, uh, suddenly they have to be A-OK -okay and clear with the, uh, the U.S. government and not on any of the travel blacklists. Uh, don't we get a say in, in who gets blacklisted like that? You, you should, um, but you know the reason why other countries don't is because they permit themselves to be subservient to the United States. And you know, I think one of the the, the important points that you've just mentioned um, is that when tensions are very high in the world and the risk of terrorism is very great, uh, then the United States, the conduct the United States engages in, isn't only affecting itself; it affects certainly the countries in close proximity to it, Mexico and Canada. Um, but even countries um, even more distant, it affects really the entire climate of the world, the geopolitical climate, the way in which countries relate to their own citizenry. And I think it's very important to realize that what the United States has been doing in the world for the last decade, since 9-11, invading other countries, bombing um, multiple countries, including ones we're not at war in, killing all kinds of civilians, putting people in prison without any due process, um, engaging in extreme levels of secrecy, telling the world that they have no right to even know what it is we're doing or to check our leaders, is precisely what is escalating tensions. It's what's making so many people in the world hate the United States and resent the West. Obviously, if a country spends a decade invading and bombing other countries and, and putting their citizens into cages without any charges or trials, extreme levels of hostility will, will arise with regard to that country and its allies. And it's precisely for that reason that the risk of terrorism is so high and, and other countries um, are being affected in, in significant ways in terms of their liberties, in terms of their finance, in terms of their ability to travel. Um, and that's why I say I think it is incumbent upon other countries um, that are affected negatively by these policies to have their government uh, try and impede them and, and not simply acquiesce to them because the United States is perceived to be a stronger country. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, Glenn Greenwald was our guest today. He is the author of With Liberty and Justice for Some. Uh, he's an award-winning uh, journalist and blogger uh, from the United States, and he'll be appearing here in Ottawa on April 12th.